So in this video, we'll take a closer look at this Fujitsu Futro S740. It's a very small form factor thin client that you can actually use for a lot of other stuff, running something in your home lab, kind of replacing a Raspberry Pi. This, of course, is much more powerful, but doesn't really consume a lot of power. Around 3-4 watt idle, up to around the 15 watt-ish, of course, on the load. So definitely very power efficient, and it is a completely passive little system. And this specific one here is a pretty basic version, so 16 gigabytes of SSD, and this is a SATA M.2 SSD, and we have 8 gigabytes of memory. Let's have a look at the front here. We do have two USB 3.0 headphone and microphone in. Of course, a power button here as well. On all of the sides, we do have a lot of air vents or holes. On the case, of course, this is, like I said, a passively cool device, so it does need to get rid of some heat. On the back side, this is, like I said, a pretty basic version. So we don't have USB Type-C, but there is actually room for it here. You can also get a VGA module, and I believe you can also even get these that powers over Ethernet. This one does not, so it does require a power supply. Comes with a fairly small 65 watt power supply into the standard 5.5 millimeter barrel jack, which of course you plug in here. You have two display out, which is kind of nice. And of course you can adapt these to like HDMI and whatever. If you want to connect it up to a TV, use it as a media player. Then we have another plug here. I believe it's for speaker out. And we do have a one gig NIC or LAN on board. This is a real tech NIC. NIC, unfortunately, not Intel, but it's still fine enough. I've had no issues with any of the devices I had. We have four USB 2.0 on the back. Would have been nice to see some more USB 3.0 on the back, but still fine enough and also nice if you want to connect some other peripherals to this one here. Of course, keyboard, mouse and such doesn't really need USB 3.0. On the other side, a lot of holes for ventilation. Bottom side as well, some holes for ventilation. And on the top, of course, a lot of holes for ventilation. You do also get these plastic feet that you can attach to the unit. So you could either keep it in an upright position. You can see the holes on the bottom, kind of fits all the plastic studs here on the feet. And then you just kind of put them in place. And then you just squeeze that little plastic tab here into the plastic stud. This way it won't come loose. And the same goes for the bottom here. Same two holes, same feet you use there. And you can just, of course, connect it like so. And Keep it on the desk and they will just raise it up a little bit from the surface so you can get a little bit of air circulation here underneath but i don't really think you need it you can also just probably use some rubber feet put them on there and that will be just fine but i'm going to use these plastic feet because i got them included of course and i'm just going to keep it upright so i can keep it on my network shelf so i can have multiple of these like stacked up together next to each other and run a little cluster system or yeah whatever you want to do i have one set up for home assistant right now Another one set up for my web server, just running Debian and Docker containers on there. This one here I want to set up as a Proxmox server, not to run anything permanently, but just to test out various virtual machines and so on. So this would be a little test machine. And for this I have already bought two M.2 NVMe SSDs that we are going to connect today. And we're going to use these adapters to do so. So we can adapt M.2 A and E key to NVMe SSD. These are just 30 millimeters. But we can actually have up to 42 millimeters in here, so we can actually have two drives. Of course, the main one is M.2 SATA, and then the A and E key will be NVMe. I've even seen people like using this whole adapter and actually just using an 80 millimeter SSD, which is definitely something you can do. But anyways, let's just get into it and actually open it up. On the back side, you do have two screws here on each side. So of course, you have to unscrew those, move this little flap down a little bit, and you can kind of squeeze the whole top lid off towards the back and just remove it pretty easy you can also actually remove the whole back plate here but you don't really need to do so one thing i found on a lot of these used machines that i have like i said i have 10 of them is that this one tends to come loose so maybe it's a good idea to just glue it in place this one is guess, actually fine but it will just kind of rattle around in there it doesn't really do much other than get in contact with the back portion here, just squeezing into this. I'm not really sure what the purpose is really, maybe just to shield it off. But other than that, pretty good construction actually, very simple, and I really like that. So let's get a little bit closer here and have a look at the motherboard itself. Of course, we do have the M.2 SATA SSD. This is also a 42 millimeter. Can of course replace that with a bigger one. You could even have, a, have an 80 millimeter. As long as it's running on SATA protocol, you can see here, you can actually have an 80 millimeter and you can actually also have a standard Wi-Fi card or maybe a SATA adapter here in the 
other M.2 slot, that's definitely also something you can do. And I have like 80 millimeters SSDs in the two other I have already running. But this one I wanted to do a little bit different. So just run the OS off of the 16 gigabyte SSD and then run all of my virtual machines or containers off of the 256 gigabyte SSDs. That's supposed to be brand new, bottom of eBay supposed to be removed from a new machine. But on the inside here, we do have a USB 3.0 header up here. So you could actually adapt that to yeah, whatever you would like. But I will leave, if you specify it with USB Type-C here on the back, this is where it plugs in. So it plugs into a USB 3.0 plug or 3.1 Gen 1. So five gigabit per second. So if you can find an adapter, you could definitely also make USB Type-C work. I'm not sure what the other plug here does on the motherboard. It looks kind of similar, but definitely smaller. And of course, like I said, you do have the M.2 slot over here for a SATA SSD and the other M.2 A and E key over here for either a Wi-Fi card. You could hook up a Wi-Fi card. You just need to put the antenna inside the front bezel. You can buy those antenna on eBay and so on and put them in here. There's no like room or holes to actually attach external antennas, so everything will be internal, unless of course you drill some holes. The BIOS battery here. I don't know if you can actually see this, but I've put some tape over this part here because there is a lot of light leakage. The little power status LED is actually just mounted on the motherboard, so it will just bleed through the lid of the case. So I found that to be a little bit annoying, so I put just a little bit of piece of tape over here just to kind of shield it a little bit so you still can see it in the front but it will not light up the entire room. It is quite bright, actually. The one I have came with a 8GB DDR4 SO DIMM, but I believe you can actually have up to 16GB. It is, of course, only single channel. There's only one DIMM slot in here, but 8GB is plenty for me, but 16GB is definitely also very nice if you want to run like virtual machines and so on on here. And of course, we do have that passive cooler or heatsink, so no extra fan noise or anything like that. Really like that. Another plug down here. I'm not really sure what that does. And I believe you have the networking card here. Like I said, the other black plug, I'm not sure really what that does. We also do have a little bit of tiny speaker over here. Of course, not something you can really use for any kind of audio, but just get notified when the computer starts up and so on. It will give a beep. And that's pretty much it. I really like, like I said, the simplicity of this little system here and the fact that it doesn't use that much power. Very efficient, great for home lab usage. The only real issue I have with these is that it can be a little iffy with some software, like for instance, Home Assistant. If you install it on an SSD and plug it in here, it will not automatically boot because it doesn't really support older UEFI boot modes. You need to be sure that it is in the right folder on the UEFI partition on the hard drive. It needs to be UEFI, not EFI or whatever. So it can be a little bit annoying actually Getting OSs on here like Debian, Ubuntu, no issues at all. Home Assistant, PFSense, and so on will not boot unless you just make sure you have that boot file in the EFI partition on the hard drive. But that's a little bit of downside. The easiest for me is just to install the software onto the SSD or remove the SSD and install it in another computer and then just use CloneZilla to clone it to the internal driver, to the driver I actually want to install in here. Using CloneZilla, for instance, just works. You just clone the entire content to the drive you want to use in here, and then it will boot up just fine. But that's just a workaround that works easiest for me. And you can also do it in a terminal with a command, but it just never worked for me for some reason. But anyways, in this video, we'll just be installing this adapter. And finally it arrived. I ordered this long time ago. It's nice to finally be able to complete this build. It's been on my desk for like a month or so now. So what you get with this, of course, the screws you need. And then you have the adapter here, which like I said, can adapt A and E key to full 80 millimeter NVMe SSD. One thing to note though, is this is only a one time slot. So of course you will not have four times bandwidth like most SSD have nowadays, but that's still around the 500 megabytes a second transfer speed. And of course, vastly exceeds the one gigabit per second limit of the built in NIC. Even if you install a USB 2.5 gigabit ethernet adapter, it will still not saturate that 500 megabytes per second. But that's also a positive thing, I think. So you don't really need to buy the most expensive NVMe SSDs to get actually the fastest speed because it would be kind of bottlenecked by the bandwidth. But you can also see this adapter here. You can also use it with 60 millimeter, 42 millimeters, 30 millimeters. And the last one here, I'm not sure what that is. I believe it just screws into the motherboard. My plan is just to break this specific one off here. So I can just use up to 42 millimeters. And like I said, the ones I already bought is actually 30 millimeters. But I've seen people online just mounting this like this. It does kind of get a little bit in the way of the SSD, but actually it's not all that bad. Pretty much half of the flash module there is covered when you screw it in place right here. Kind of just hold itself down and you can actually, like I said, use a full 
80 mm SSD on here and actually screw that in place. So definitely something you could do. I bought four of these adapters, so probably do that in two other machines that I have. And these two here, like I said, I will just snap it right here so I can use up to 42 millimeters in those. So let's just try that now, actually breaking it and see how easy it is. That was pretty easy actually. Let me just file that off so it looks a little cleaner there. And before actually installing it, make sure you attach this screw. Kind of a little bit different. There is a thread on the inside as well as on the outside and use the little lock nut here to actually lock it in place. So let's do that now. We have to go in from the back with the little screw and then just go in from the front and lock it in place. And of course, make sure you select the right sizing. Mine is 30 millimeter, just about to connect it to the 42 millimeter and then just screw it in place like so. So now I've installed it on the 30 millimeter cause that's the sizing I'm going to use now. Next step, of course, mount it inside of the motherboard here and screw it in place. They do not supply a screw for the stud on your motherboard. So you have to find one yourself. Let's see if we can actually find one that will fit. So I found this black one that is just a little bit lower than the actual standoff for the SSD. Would be nice if it could go a little bit lower than that, but that is definitely fine enough. You should not attach any double-sided SSDs then. You need to find a screw to actually go in further. And last thing to do, of course, is installing the SSD. This is, like I said, not a dual-sided one. If you need to use a dual-sided one, you need to use a screw that actually is recessed, not like this, sticking up a little bit. And let's just, of course, mount it like any other M.2 SSD. And then you can use the supplied little black screw, of course, to screw it in place, just like so. It does move around a little bit in there, but not really an issue. I think this is a pretty nice solution to get two drives in here up to 42 millimeters without it actually using any of the real estate of the built-in drive. So definitely an option for this one here. But I've seen a lot of forum posts online of people doing all kinds of DUI on this little machine. So definitely there are a lot of options, but that's pretty much all I have for this video. Just going through the hardware and kind of some of the options you have for installing a secondary SSD. But that's all for this one. I hope to see you again in a future one. Until then, take care.